Great. And to answer that question that just came in, welcome. And yes, this is recorded and it will be available later. I will share in just a moment where that will be. So thank you everyone for being here tonight. Um, we're talking about fall pest prevention, how to manage pests. Um, and we are brought, today, brought to you today by the Alameda Countywide Clean Water Program. I am Charlotte Canner and with me is Susan, Suzanne Bontempo, who will be talking in a moment as well. So today it's going to be a big, big program for you all. We're going to go through slides for uh, probably a little bit more than an hour, hour and 10, hopefully uh, around then. Um, this will be recorded. So if at any point you have to leave, you can always catch the end of it in the recording. Uh, today we are going to start with talking about the Our Water World Program, how we use integrated pest management, and we will talk about managing uh, common fall pests, ants, slugs, snails, earwigs, rodents, gophers, moles, raccoons, cats, squirrels, and we'll talk about dormant sprays. So today we are brought to you by the Clean Water Program of Alameda County, which works to protect Alameda County creek, creeks, wetlands, and the bay from runoff that may carry pollutants into the waterways. We talk about uh, mostly gardening, but also indoor pest management, talking about avoiding chemicals that could be washed off the lawn and garden and into storm drains by irrigation and rain. You can learn more about the Clean Water Program at cleanwaterprogram.org. You can also sign up for their newsletter and get information about events like this webinar and future webinars um, by signing up on the far right of the uh, the page, you can have a newsletter sign up and tell you tell us where the city of residence is. Um, and here you can also access their social media, YouTube channel, and um, lots of other great information. And as I mentioned, this will be recorded and it will go on to our the Clean Water Program YouTube channel. You can see all past uh, webinars that we've done, which are many, many past webinars that will go more in depth about certain things we'll cover today. Uh, so please access the YouTube channel. You can either go to YouTube and type in Clean Water Program Alameda, or you can access it through cleanwaterprogram.org. So what is the Our Water World Program? It is a California-wide program that aims to protect our waterways by providing pest problem-solving education. And we do that through partnerships with retailers like hardware stores and garden nurseries. In many of these stores, what you'll see is a fact sheet rack, like um, the upper right photo, handouts that are available to you for about common pest problems and other gardening uh, subjects. Many stores also have posters, like the QR code poster in the middle, uh, where you can scan and get that information on your phone. Many stores also have these little tags uh, that you can see on the bottom of the screen, blue tags that will highlight the eco-friendly products on the shelf. You can also uh, see what part stores we partner with, access all the fact sheets, and learn more about less toxic products at our website, ourwaterourworld.org. Um, so what do water and pesticides have to do with each other? Well, everything we do out in the world, like using pesticides and fertilizers, walking our dog, washing our car, has a direct effect on waterways. Because with urban runoff caused by rain or irrigation, all of those materials, including uh, like plastic litter, motor oil, pet waste, and debris, can enter the storm drain at the street level. And from there, it flows directly to a waterway. There's no filtration in between. It's a direct line from our street level storm drains to a creek, river, bay, and ocean. And then in addition, um, our, the water that leaves our home uh, does go to a wastewater treatment facility. So that's from our sink, shower, toilet, does go to a wastewater treatment facility. And there they process it for, they remove solids, bacteria, pathogens but they cannot remove pesticides at the wastewater treatment facility. So after it goes to the facility, it goes gets discharged out to a waterway where unfortunately, if any pesticides have entered that um, the water at the house level, it will still be there uh, once it reaches the waterway. 
So to um, uh, reduce this, we're always going to dispose properly of our pesticides and other uh, household hazardous waste at the household hazardous waste facility. And we also encourage using eco-friendlies inside the home as well because they can cause water toxicity when you're spraying and then you wipe later, you wipe the uh, mop the floor or wipe the countertops, that product is gonna get on the sponge or the mop and it will make our way, make its way into the waterways uh, through you know, cleaning your home. So we do wanna encourage you to cons still consider eco-friendly options in the home as well. What is IPM? Uh, we talked about we talked about this in all of our webinars, and we do go more in depth in other webinars as well. But we are going to talk about it today. So, integrated pest management is a holistic view. It's a big picture view of the home, a pest problem in the home or the garden. We always want to identify the problem. Is it a pest problem or is it an environmental issue? And if it is a pest problem, what pest is it? We're going to monitor it, see if it's getting worse. Uh, and then evaluate, is it getting so bad that we need to take action or maybe it's you know still at a level where we can easily manage it or ignore it. Uh, we are gonna involve some preventative measures either before the pests arrive or when they're, when they're there to prevent further damage. And then we're gonna choose some action steps if we decide that the damage is enough for us to take action. There are several action steps that we'll review together. And then of course, you always wanna monitor after you take action, did what you do, was it effective or do you maybe need to try something else? So our action steps that we'll go into today, uh, cultural controls, which is all about the health of the garden, mechanical or physical controls, traps, barriers, and tools, the biological controls, which is focusing on the beneficial insects and supporting the ecosystem of the garden and then chemical controls, which are pesticides. In IPM, they are always used as a last resort. Thank you, Charlotte. So I am going to review uh, some of the IPM controls and we're going to start with cultural controls. And give me one second, please. So we are very familiar with um, the importance of building healthy soils. And we do that by adding compost to the soil. Uh, we can also do that by adding earthworm castings. Uh, there are so many benefits to adding compost and earthworm castings to the soil, uh, such as improving the soil structure, increasing the water retention in the soil, increasing the microbiology in the soil. But when we're adding compost, uh, we are reducing the need for pesticides because uh, all those microbes are able to fight pathogens and bad bacteria in the soil. And it's also going to support the health of the root zone of those plants. When we're adding earthworm castings to the soil, earthworm castings contain an abundance of nutrients and minerals essential for the plants to thrive, the health of the plants to thrive. And they're also highly effective for preventing insect pests um, and diseases that might affect that plant. We're going to feed with organic fertilizers. Organic fertilizers are going to be a more natural way for those plants to uh, access uh, the nutrients. Um, it actually works with the symbiotic relationship. We're actually feeding the microbiology in the soil and then those microbes are actually uh, feeding the or providing the nutrients making those nutrients available to the plant so they can take it on an as need basis. But why this helps reduce pests is that uh, the plant is able to grow at a more natural rate, uh, which is going to prevent growth spurts that attract pests such as aphids. When we're feeding with synthetic fertilizers, the synthetic fertilizers act as like steroids that are stimulating a lot of new growth. And those pests uh, really love that new growth um, mulch. Mulch is going to um, protect our soil, keeping it warm in the winter, cool in the summer, reduces water evaporation rate, um, you know, and feeds the soil as it breaks down. But it also helps reduce weeds. It uh, reduces um, weed seeds from germinating. So it's going to actually uh, help us with to prevent those uh, weedy pests. And then it's also going to provide habitat for a lot of our beneficial insects, which is so important to help keeping the balance in the garden. 
Um, although I do want to just take a side note, we want to always leave uh, sections or sections of the garden uh, bare and cultivated because we have um, native bees here in California and 70% of those native bees are actually uh, ground dwellers. So they're going to benefit from not having the garden completely covered with mulch. And then uh, we also always want to make sure the crown of those plants are free from leaf debris and mulch and soil because the where the top part of the plant and the root system meet, we always want to make sure that's clean and nice airflow. We want to always plant the right plant in the right place. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Uh, we want to rotate annual food crops. This is really important. Um, I know it's not easy for all of us, but uh, it, it is really important to rotate those annual food crops whenever possible. We're going to water deeply and less often as plants grow. We want to really encourage nice, deep, broad root systems. And we do that by watering until they become established. And then we're going to provide healthy garden maintenance practices. All right, so plant selection, uh, really uh, has a lot to do with reducing pest problems. So we want to always plant the right plant in the right place, and that's up to us to do our homework. We wanna reference those really great uh, resources like the Sunset Western Garden Book, uh, California Native Plant Society website, uh, even Master Gardener websites are gonna help us out. We're gonna read these tags. We're gonna learn about the size. Uh, what's the maximum size of this plant uh, at maturity? Uh, what is the sun exposure? What does is, what is the plant needs? A lot of the plant needs are gonna be on these tags, okay? We always wanna match the plants to the conditions of our garden because when we do, we are uh, preventing the plants from being stressed out. And when a plant is stressed, it's gonna be more susceptible to pest problems. When a plant is happy and healthy, it's going to be less likely to get any pest problems. And if it does, it can really uh, kind of grow through that. We want to match the mature, the mature size of the plant to the space available. Now, I uh, oftentimes will try to uh, squeeze plants in. We wanna avoid overcrowding. We want to squeeze plants in or really push some limits. And then when a plant starts to grow out of its space, we have a tendency to prune, prune, prune. Well, guess what? When we're pruning frequently, we're stressing that plant out and we're stimulating a lot of new growth. And, and as we know, uh, insect pests like aphids and uh, white fly nymphs and so forth love that new growth. So we always want to match the mature size of the plant to the space available. Uh, sometimes it's hard to believe that plant's gonna grow that big, but it will. Uh, I mentioned overcrowding. Uh, we always wanna have nice airflow because it's going to avoid some pests like spider mites and white flies. And then we want to always group plants together that will share their similar needs once established. So that's going to need uh, you know, water requirements or sun exposure and so forth. We're going to plant correctly. And what that means is we're going to plant uh, very similar to this illustration where the crown of the plant, where the top, you know, the stem and the root system meet, that's the crown. It's just going to be ever so slightly above the grade of the soil because then it's going to settle a little bit and we're going to add mulch. And we really want to make sure we're not creating something that sinks because when a plant with that root ball of that plant sinks, uh, soil and mulch is uh, very likely to come around that crown and cause some problems. And then, as I mentioned, we're going to grow deep root systems uh, by watering it, watering um, to really help that plant become established to grow a healthy root zone. Now we're gonna provide uh, healthy garden maintenance practices. So we're going to harvest all the food crops that we have. I was just out there right now, getting the last of the tomatoes, cutting them down, getting them in the compost, uh, removing any remaining apples that might be on the apple trees. Uh, any food that might be lingering, any diseased parts of plants like those uh, black spot on the rose leaves or rust on the rose leaves, I wanna remove them, get them, Anything that's diseased, I wanna get into the green waste bin. If anything has, I, I suspect I've got some coddling moths and some of those apples, those are gonna go into the green waste bin, the municipal bin that's gonna go off site. And then anything that is free of diseases or pests, I can put in my home compost 
But the reason why we do this is because uh, over the winter months, uh, we if we've got food in the garden, we're going to attract uh, rodents, other urban critters like raccoons, skunks, a uh, deer, if you're in that area. Uh, and then in the summer months, of course, yellow jackets. Um, and then we, when we're cleaning up the garden, uh, just, just by going around and cleaning up the garden, it helps us monitor for any problems. You know, if there's a broken irrigation or if there is, um, you know, a stake, a tree that has a, a stake that's tied to it and we see, oh, it's time to take that, you know, tie off because it's choking the tree, things like that. And we want to go around and do some selective but very mindful pruning. And what I mean by that is, you know, there might be a limb that's over a fence that we want to trim back in case a storm comes. We don't want it to maybe threaten the um, security of that fence or if it's a shed or a house, but we also want to make sure there isn't like a bird nest or a uh, uh, butterfly chrysalis or anything like that, that we would, uh, uh, we would do some harm. We just really really be mindful and do some light pruning where only where needed. And then you might be familiar with some of the campaigns that are out there right now. I've sure been seeing them, which is so fun is leave the leaves. So when we have uh, deciduous trees on our property, trees that actually are dropping their leaves and uh, giving us that beautiful fall color, uh, it is a nice practice to leave some of them when it is appropriate. Of course, if they're falling on our lawn or a garden bed uh, on our shrubs, we might want to kind of go through and clean those up. But if there's areas of the garden where we can leave leaves, this is Mother Nature's mulch. It's also providing a lot of um, habitat for our beneficial insects. Uh, so it is really nice. Uh, it's also going to support the birds. And we can also go around and not clean everything up in regards to pruning back. So this is a little bit of also what I mean with mindful pruning. I'm leaving things uh, kind of as they are. So this aster right here, uh, after it blooms, it looks exactly like that picture in the top left where those are the seeds that the birds have been enjoying. So I'm leaving that. Um, the Japanese anemones, I'm leaving those fluffs because those little fluffs are providing nesting material for the birds. And then of course, berries like elderberry, snowberries and so forth. This is going to be food, uh, nutrient rich uh, food for our songbirds. All right, and then next, so that was all cultural controls, really focusing on the health of the garden, uh, keeping our plants less stressed. And then now we're gonna focus on mechanical controls. These are also called physical controls because there are all like physical things that we can do. So in the home, there's adding weather stripping, uh, caulking any cracks and crevices and door sweeps. All those tools are gonna be great for keeping our crawling insects like ants out of our home. Uh, quarter inch hardware cloth and sheet metal corners are going to help with keeping rodents out and then weeding tools for uh, tools just to physically manually remove weeds. Our row cover is another physical barrier we can use in the garden and then traps like rodent traps, all physical non-toxic ways to keep uh, pests out or contain them or kill them as needed. So in the garden, a few more barriers to think about is a row cover, like the, it's the middle picture, the white uh, cloth. It's very light, it keeps snow, I mean, sorry. So it keeps, it allows sun and rain in, water in, uh, but it keeps out our flying uh, insects. Uh, so preventing uh, cabbage moth laying their eggs on our cabbages and kale, that's really effective for that. Also keeps birds out to, from damaging our seedlings. Uh, there's deer fencing, there's any kind of netting, uh, like in the top left, that will prevent birds and other flying insects from landing on our plants and maybe laying their eggs on there. There's, of course, gopher baskets in the bottom left, always great idea to put your plants, put any new plants in a gopher basket. Gophers are everywhere in the Bay Area, so definitely uh, something to consider, and um, we'll talk more about gophers later. Uh, we have copper tape barrier, which I'll also talk about later with our snails and slugs. Great, just physical way to keep uh, snails and slugs away from our yummy seedlings. And then a scare tape, which is not necessarily a barrier, but little shiny uh, ribbon or objects will help prevent, uh, keep birds away. 
Sheet mulching is an excellent tool, a physical barrier, especially for weeds, especially as we're going into the rainy season, those weeds are already popping up. I know I already have oxalis popping up in my yard. Uh, sheet mulching is an excellent, excellent tool against those weeds. It, sheet mulching is several layers of cardboard, uh, layered, overlapping, well overlapping, and then putting sheet mulch, uh, sorry, mulching like uh, wood chips bark on top of that cardboard. You can also use it to get rid of a lawn, smother an area where weeds are already, or cover an area where you're expecting weeds. Um, it also regenerates soil. Uh, so if you have an area that's not doesn't have great soil, you can put down that sheet mulching. As the rain comes, it's going to uh, moisten everything. It's going to break down into the soil. It's going to feed the soil as it smothers whatever is underneath it. Another, and then another look at tool or uh, barriers in the garden. Uh, exclusion frames are really effective at uh, keeping our rodents out. There's really, you know, no amount of repellent uh, or scare crow is going to keep uh, rodents and raccoons away from your yummy tomatoes. So considering putting in exclusion frames a physical barrier to keep those rats and mice out and raccoons and other critters. So again, when we're using um, fencing, baskets, barriers of any kind, we want to understand what pest we are targeting to keep out. If we have rats and mice, we're going to use quarter inch hardware cloth and we're gonna make sure it's sealed at every side. Uh, that's going. That's the size that mice and young rats cannot fit through, um, and also adult rats. <laughs> if we have, we're preventing gophers, uh, we are going to use half inch hardware cloth, either lining our raised beds before we put the soil in, uh, all the way up the side of, of the raised bed with half inch hardware cloth, or we can create baskets underneath the soil to prevent, uh, to protect our plant roots. We have squirrels, we're going to use three quarter inch, inch fencing or poultry wire. And then if we have deer, we are going to consider a at least seven foot tall fence. Uh, some more physical controls are traps and traps come in a variety uh, for a variety of pests. Uh, we can consider the mole and gopher traps, uh, rat traps, there's yellow jacket traps and fly traps, great just hanging in them in the area. The earlier you put the, oh, your yellow jacket trap, so in like February or March, uh, even if you think it's really early, it's going to capture that queen and re really reduce the population in your area. Uh, then there's sticky traps, which are excellent for flying insects, and then the snail and slug board trap, which we will also talk about later when we talk about snails and slugs. So lots of different traps. Uh, and then a few more sticky traps to consider in the home. So sticky traps are great to identify where a pest problem is. Um, and then you can focus your action in that area. I know we don't always know where the pest is coming from in our home, but if you put sticky traps around and you see a lot um, of activity on one, you know that's probably where they're gonna go. Um, I will say, and there's like, there's roach traps, there's all kinds of insect uh, sticky traps. I will say, I don't, we don't um, condone uh, catching and killing spiders, but uh, so if you do have spiders in your home, you know, capturing it, releasing it outside, spiders are excellent pest managers. They eat a lot of insect pests, so, but I do understand that they're not that pleasant to have in the home. So we can do what we can to protect them, capturing them, releasing them outside. But then if you do want to capture them and not release them, sticky traps are an effective tool. Also vacuuming them up if needed is also an effective tool. Then we have, speaking of garden allies, we have our biological controls. <laughs> um, and that is really understanding the good bugs in the garden. 90% of the bugs in the garden are good bugs. So that's why we talk about identification. Um, identification is key because a lot, as we'll talk about a little bit later, good bugs look like pest bugs, but we, so we need to know what we're looking at. And then if we do have good bugs, we're gonna support them. We're not gonna spray our pesticides because they can sometimes harm them. And we also want to invite them in because these good bugs eat pest insects, they pollinate our flowers and fruit, and they also can parasitize pests, which is uh, kind of crazy, but really awesome. <laughs> 
Um, and then ways to attract them. So of course we can buy them and release them into our yards. You can often buy ladybugs and lace wings and mantids at a garden centers and nurseries, but a great way to encourage the biodiversity or the, uh, you know, the good bugs and the ecosystem of your yard is to plant biodiversity because planting biodiversity, a variety of kinds of plants, many different kinds of flowers, different kinds of non-flowering plants even is going to invite in a diverse um, bugs too and my, more diversity of bugs will keep balance. So the good bugs will come in, maybe the bad bugs will come in, but the good bugs will be there to keep balance. So some plants uh, that we generally like to focus on, if you're planning on attracting these good bugs to the garden, uh, many of them are pictured in this one picture. Uh, there are plants that look like daisies or sunflowers. They have that button in the middle with the ray of petals around. So we have our daisies and our coreopsis right here. And then we have our yarrow also. And in the bottom corner, we have our sweet alyssum. Um, those are examples of plants with clusters of tiny little flowers. Those are also going to be really attractive to the beneficials. Our beneficials have really tiny mouth parts, so they like plants with uh, little tiny flowers so they can easily access that nectar and pollen. Right, now I am going to talk about the chemical controls, the pesticides that we uh, could use around our garden and our home to solve to manage pests. But what I'd like to share is that pesticides don't solve the pest problem. They're just killing the pest. And so we're going to utilize all of those other approaches that Charlotte and I have already mentioned. However, when we do go for a pesticide, I just want to um, go walk through some of the things that I can, um, that we'd like to share so that you are aware. Um, some pests are seasonal and to be expected. Um, pests are food for beneficial insects, which, uh, you know, beneficial insects are going to help keep our gardens in a healthy balance. Um, and if there is a pest involved, or if we see a pest out there, what I'd like to ask is, it gives us an opportunity to get curious and to see, um, really pause and see how much damage can that plant handle and, um, how much damage can that plant or the environment tolerate, but in comparison um, to how much, what, how much can we handle? So, so oftentimes we are going to react. We are going to have a very uh, short, uh, small threshold where we really don't, sometimes don't have the tolerance for any pests, but understanding that the the plants have adapted uh, oftentimes to these pest problems that the pests are part of the ecology of that garden and that they're actually um, food for other beneficial insects as well as for the birds and such. And then I can also share that oftentimes when we see a pest problem, it's a clue that something is not working or that the plant is stressed. So this is another um, opportunity to get curious to see what's going on because maybe the irrigation is broken and that water, that plant is getting overwatered and that's why it's stressed. So these are some things to consider. So when we use pesticides, we always wanna use them as a last resort. We always wanna choose eco-friendly and less toxic pesticides. We want to apply those pesticides according to the label. We want to wear PPE and we wanna understand the risks. So there are so many eco-friendly um, pesticides on the market nowadays. It's pretty amazing. Um, we've got insecticidal soaps, uh, bio-pesticides, I'm sorry, botanical pesticides. These come from uh, plant parts, plant material. That's where they thrive, um, are derived from plants. Uh, Biopesticides are coming from the um, beneficial bacteria and other organisms that will help manage pests. We have oils and neem and like copper soap. Uh, all of these are fantastic and eco-friendly. So uh, something we also wanted to share with you is um, kind of the different ways pests uh, uh, work or what, what kinds of damage that they do. So different types of pests, some pests have uh, sucking or rasping mouth parts. So we can consider like uh, aphids, um, they're going to have 
um, sucking mouth parts, uh, as well as like white fly nymphs and mealy bugs and so forth. And then rasping mouth parts would be like a spider mite or thrips. And these insects are pretty easy. We can just wipe them off or syringe them with some water, a little spray bottle of water. We can invite beneficial insects by planting more flowers. We can avoid synthetic fertilizers because that's going to stimulate a lot of new growth and that's going to attract these pests. We want to increase that circulation by mindfully pruning. We want to irrigate properly. And then if we do need to go for a pesticide, we'll work with insecticidal soap or oils. Chewing mouth parts. So this would be, you know, like caterpillars, uh, leaf rollers, and so forth. Um, we can remove them by hand. Um, weevils and beetles also. We can remove them by hand. We can work with traps and barriers. Uh, we can... Um, Oftentimes the larval stage of um, many of the beetles that we see in the garden, um, flea beetles, cucumber beetles and so forth, uh, even um, leaf miners, there is a stage either that they will, a part of their larva, their, a larval stage will be in the soil at one point or they will hibernate in the soil. And when that is the case, we can take advantage of beneficial nematodes which feed on soil dwelling insects. We can also use BT, the Bacillus thurgiensis, which is a beneficial bacteria. And then um, Spinosad, uh, which is um, a product that's on the market under the name of like maybe Captain Jack's or Garden Insect Control by Monterey. Um, that's actually going to be very effective for insects with chewing mouth parts, but also it will cover spider mites and thrips. And then, um, iron phosphate, which is uh, um, the active ingredient in products like Sluggo, which is going to be ideal for managing slugs and snails. So crawling insects, we can um, remove them by hand. We can work with barriers and traps, and we can also work with diatomaceous earth. Um, and if it is, like I said, a crawling insect that would benefit from a bait, we can also work with baits. So it's, um, we just like to share the difference between um, a couple of the common pesticides that we help folks with on a regular basis, or these are questions we get on a regular basis. So we just wanna know how the pesticide is intended to work. First of all, we always wanna read the label, but insecticidal soap, it, the active ingredient is potassium salts of fatty acid, uh, is not dish detergent. Um, Insecticidal soap uh, is a contact kill, so it does have to make contact with the insect to kill it. It um, actually melts the soft bodies of soft bodied insects, such as um, aphids and white fly nymphs, mealybugs, and so forth. So it's very effective. We want to read that label and apply it in accordance to the label. It's very narrow spectrum, so it's only going to kill a very short list of insects. Um, and it is used to kill soft-bodied insects and it's not a detergent. So neem. Neem is clarified hydrophobic extract of neem oil. Uh, it is a contact uh, pesticide, so it does need to make contact with that pest. It could, in some cases, take up to four days before it kills that pest. So be patient. Um, it is broad spectrum, so it has a longer list of insects that it's going to manage, and it is going to be uh, an insecticide, a fungicide, and a miticide. So it's kind of considered a three-in-one, so it's going to be very broad spectrum to manage both insects, mites, and uh, fungal um, diseases. And then spinosad. Spinosad is um, very interesting. It's derived, um, it's a bacterium which disrupts the insect's uh, neurotransmission. So it does need to be ingested. So that's why it's so excellent with, um, for insects with those chewing mouth parts or those rasping mouth parts, thrips, spider mites, and um, leaf miners and other uh, leaf rolling caterpillars and other pest caterpillars. It is very broad spectrum. So it does have a longer list of pests that it manages. Um, it kills the insects with its chewing um, that have chewing and rasping mouth parts, as I mentioned. And here is something to keep in mind that the label instructs that you it is limited to six applications a year. So if this is a, a pesticide we choose to use, we want to be very strategic with how we use it and our timing needs to be very accurate because of that limitation. 
uh, different ways to buy pesticides. There are ready to use uh, containers where the pesticides are already just ready to go. You just turn it on and spray. Uh, there are ready to spray uh, hose end um, bottles, which is going to uh, attach the hose and then we can spray down an area. Uh, not always convenient if you've got just a couple of trees. Um, this, oftentimes the pesticide can go beyond the tree and get something in the background that is not targeted and could do some damage. So these are really best for, for spraying down a larger area, like a turf area or a, a hedgerow of shrubs for some reason. So not always um, very popular and something to consider. Uh, it's a very rare occasion that you would actually need it. Concentrates, of course, we would have to then mix with water, uh, identifying what volume of pesticide we'd need to mix. Oftentimes, uh, we really don't need to use that much product. So working with a concentrate can be a little challenging if we only need to mix up like maybe a half a cup of a pesticide. Doing that math can be a little hard, uh, but understand when we do mix, uh, when we are using concentrates and we mix it with water, we do have to use what we've mixed. We don't get to store it because it doesn't have those stabilizing agents or those uh, preservatives. So it's really important to only mix what we're going to use. Uh, powders, powders can um, be used as dust, depending on the product, depending on the pest. Sometimes we'll use them as a dust to dust the plants. Uh, sometimes there, it's also instructed to mix with water um, and then like a wettable powder and that we're then going to spray onto the plants later as a pesticide. And then there's baits and baits will, um, large category. And these are products that would need to get ingested. And then, um, sorry, we're going to look at how to read a pesticide label because this is where things are um, get a little difficult. The fonts are very, very tiny. You definitely need to have your reading glasses or some type of a uh, loop or something to see it oftentimes because it is very, very tiny. Um, but we wanna identify what are the active ingredients. And if you're not familiar with those active ingredients, go ahead and look them up on the, um, do a web search so that you're really familiar with what you're using. Also understand that there's going to be a signal word on that pesticide label. Even if it's registered for organic use, these are all pesticides designed to kill something. So we're going to see signal warnings on there. Caution means slightly toxic. Uh, a warning uh, means moderately toxic. And then danger means highly toxic or a corrosive product. And then, um, here we're going to just briefly go through what some of this part of the label might mean. Um, this is really helpful to dive in deeper when we're looking at that label. Sometimes it's a whole book, but this here says we're going to shake it really well before using. Um, this product is a contact, non-select, broad spectrum, foliar applied grass and weed killer. So contact means it has to make contact with those plant parts. You know, whatever the pest is, whatever we're trying to kill, it needs to make contact with it. Non-select means that uh, it is not going to, um, it, it will kill anything it makes contact with. So if you've got some roses next to some weeds that you want to kill, make sure you're really per only targeting those weeds that you want to kill. It's broad spectrum. So it's going to have a very long list of uh, weeds that it will kill. Um, and so that's just something to be familiar with. Uh, we also want to understand that this is a product that can kill many types of weeds and grasses, and then it's um, an alternate solution to synthetic uh, grass and weed killers. Um, and it does not translocate. It's not going to move through the soil or other plant parts. It is rainproof when dry. So whenever we're using a pesticide, we really want to pay attention to the forecast and make sure that there is no rain in the coming 48 hours. Uh, we want to make sure that these products are dry on the plant and that they've got some time to uh, do what they need to do before the rains come. And this is a people and pet safe product when used as directed. So something else to keep in mind when we're working with organic uh, pesticides or pesticides that are uh, registered for organic use or OMRI certified, these um, they're eco-friendly, but again, we have to make sure we're using them in accordance to the label so that we are not um, making them more hazardous than they could be. 
here is just the list of very, well, this is one section of the list of all the pests, the weeds that it manages. So let's say if I was looking to uh, manage some clover, clover is on the list so I can use this product for clover. If the pest that I am trying to manage is not on the label, then that product is not going to work for that pest. And then there's always going to be precautionary statements because as I mentioned, these are registered as pesticides. All right. And then when, as uh, Suzanne has mentioned, uh, these are pesticides, they are designed to kill something even if they are eco-friendly. So we want to make sure we're always careful when spraying, we're going to wear our PPE. That does not mean you need to get a Tyvek suit and a gas mask, but what you do want to do is make sure you're covering your skin, you're wearing closed toed shoes, long pants, long sleeves, uh, cover your face with a mask, and if you can put on some sunglasses or eye covering, uh, even though they are eco-friendly, uh, they can cause reactions, dermal reactions or eye and lung irritation. So we do want to make sure that we are covered and we're not out there in our flip-flops um, and short shorts uh, spraying because we don't want to cause a, uh, any reaction. Uh, some more tips for using pesticides. So again, we're going to understand the mode of action, which Suzanne has uh, already covered a few uh, pesticides and how they work. I do recommend looking at that, uh, the link I shared, the um, I, NPIC, <laughs> um, to learn more about the pesticide before you spray and how it works. Uh, understand some less toxic products will may take longer to work. That does not mean that they are inferior. You just need to be patient and understand making sure that you're uh, spraying it or applying it appropriately. Timing is important. We do want to understand the pest life cycle because not all, all pesticides or the pesticide might work on that pest in the larval stage, but maybe not in the adult stage. So we, again, we want to know when, uh, what stage that pest is in and when we're applying it. Uh, we're always going to spot treat. We're, that means we're targeting the pest. We're not spraying the whole garden down just in case. We're spraying where the pest is when the pest is present. Uh, there's one exception to that rule and we're gonna talk about it at the end of this program. Um, but generally we're never going to uh, just spray just in case because as mentioned, many of these are contact kills. They need to come in contact with the pest and many of them dry quickly or break down very quickly in the environment. So if they're sprayed where the pest is not, uh, they're gonna break down quickly and basically we're just wasting uh, product at that point and potentially harming something else. We're always gonna apply pesticides at dusk. That is when the beneficial insects are less active. Uh, so we have less chance of harming them. We are also going to, uh, that's going to give the product time overnight uh, to, to be effective uh, and then dry out before the sun comes up in the morning. And some of these products do break down in sunlight. So we, again, we want to spray at the end of the day to give them a longer chance of, of working. If we're planning to release beneficials or if you're planting to encourage the beneficials, then I would uh, consider either give them time to do their pest management, or maybe consider not using pesticides if you are trying to encourage those beneficials. Um, and then we're going to understand the unintended consequences as well. Um, and that means, uh, so no pesticide is risk-free. Again, these are registered pesticides that are designed to kill. So um, uh, even DIY homemade pesticides can cause harm to ourselves, the environment, our plants, uh, so we do want to make sure that we are understanding what we're doing. Drift from pesticides can cause damage to plants we didn't intend to, which is why we never spray when it's windy out. And we also want to avoid uh, rain within 48 hours of application as well. Uh, pesticides can contaminate the water or, and then, I mean, the soil and the groundwater uh, if improperly applied or overused. And then uh, we can also cause damage to soil microbes, um, especially if we're using it improperly. And remember, more is not better. Applying according to the label when at the, at the right time is going to be the most effective and safest way to apply. So I mentioned how DIY remedies are not generally 
uh, they're not necessarily safer uh, and they might not be that effective either. This is why we always encourage to, uh, if you are working with a pesticide, purchase the pesticide from the shelves instead of trying to make your own at home. Um, we don't know how these products mix together. We don't know how they interact with the soil or the plant or our skin. So we always just wanna go with the product that is tested, has instructions, has warning labels, and we can understand how it works. Um, some of the things we have heard of people mixing together, dish soap is a very common one. Uh, dish soap is our, our, our detergents, they're not soaps. So we they have a lot of other ingredients in them that can cause toxicity to aquatic life and even ourselves. So we wanna look at the label. We can read about those ingredients um, if you are considering a soap, I will say uh, one exception is to uh, use Castile soap. Castile soap is a pure soap. It's a pure soap on the market. That's so it's usually the brand is Dr. Bronner's or there is a Whole Foods 365 brand. It's going to be pure soap uh, that breaks down quickly and doesn't have any extra ingredients that can cause toxicity to waterways. Salt, often used for weeds and other uh, snails and other critters, uh, understand that salt is detrimental to the soil, worms, and other soil organisms, and it can cause our soil, it can inhibit our soil's ability to take up water. So overuse of salt can actually uh, hurt your plants in the long run because the soil won't be um, as healthy. And then vinegar also is sold as a weed killer, um, and it can be effective as a weed killer. Uh, and of course, it's also a uh, used in the home for various cleaning. Um, I, I mean, it's fine to use those, but understand that household vinegar that we're like eating is only 5% acetic acid. Um, a, a, when we get to 11%, that can cause uh, burning of the skin and eye damage. And then horticultural vinegar that is sold as a weed killer is usually at 20 or 30% acetic acid, and that can cause blindness um, and is corrosive to metals. So when we are using that, we're just going to use extreme caution. Of course, we're wearing our PPE and we're going to uh, mix appropriately and apply safely. And as I mentioned at the beginning, what should you do with products you no longer want? We are going to take them to the local household hazardous waste facility. Um, they are, check where the nearest one is to your home. Uh, it is free for if you are if you're a resident of that county. It is free for you to drop off those materials, um, and it's quite easy if you have a car. <laughs> All right, thank you. So I we have about 20 more minutes of the program. As we mentioned, we are going a little longer than normal, but we just really wanted to uh, get all of that information in as the foundation for pest management. Uh, because when we can, I feel like it really helps us moving forward. And as we move forward the the remaining time together, I'm going to, or Charlotte and I will go through applying IPM techniques for common pest problems. So the first step with pest management is identifying the pest. Again, if we can't identify the pest, we're not going to be able to solve the problem. So we want to understand uh, that we want to know who the pest is, understand the life cycle of that pest, because um, that helps us manage the pest. The pest habitat and the timing of its action will also um, help us um, with what type of um, action we need to take. So something I like to think about are the spittle bugs in the spring. When I start to see spittle bugs, we start to get a lot of questions like, oh gosh, there's this, it looks like someone spit on my plants. What do I need to do? What's the pesticide? Well, we really don't have to do anything. You can um, spray it off with water or syringe it with a spray bottle of water, but also understand that the life cycle of the spittle bug is usually just two weeks. So there isn't a lot that you have to do. So in that case, you can relax. Uh, so it just helps us to identify what the pest is. And then we also wanna see, are there any beneficial insects around? Are the natural enemies present? Because if they are, then we really can just sit back and relax because they're taking care of this product problem for us. So I want to just share that uh, we see this pest on our rows. It's next to the aphids. Is it a pest or a pal? 
Are we going to squish it? Are we going to go for um, insecticidal soap because it's a soft bodied, we can kill it. Uh, but guess what? It's a surfeit fly larvae. Surfeit fly larvae are going to look like little worms or caterpillars, and they have a racing stripe down their back. And hopefully you can see that in this picture. They absolutely love aphids. And what their adult, uh, this hoverfly or surfeit fly loves is sweet alyssum. So me, part of my IPM program in my garden is I plant sweet alyssum at the base of my roses, and it attracts the hoverfly. The hoverflies see that I've got aphids on my roses because I'm leaving some aphids because my threshold is pretty big. And then lo and behold, after about a week, I go out on my um, sunset insect hunt and I see surfeit fly larvae. It's amazing. And then something else to share that it's really easy to misidentify a pest. So, or an insect, I should say. This is the mealy bug destroyer. It feeds on mealy bugs. This is a flea beetle, which feeds on the foliage of seedlings and leafy greens. Good bug, bad bug. And then um, it doesn't stop there. You know, we see this on our leaves of the fruit trees in the spring. What do we do? This is aphid. This is from aphid damage. And this is a plum tree. This is peach leaf curl. This is a fungal disease. Understand that. Uh, these are two very different pests. And so one, the plum, the aphids will pucker those leaves on the plum by sucking its juices out of those leaves. This would require an insecticide to manage it if there are no beneficial insects already present. And then the peach leaf curl requires a fungicide to manage it. So these are um, true to life uh, scenarios that I have uh, been I've witnessed in the aisle with people asking me these questions. So that's why I want to share them with you. And then this is one that we got from our last program. Um, one of our guests sent me these pictures or sent us these pictures afterwards. We have all these weird little bulbous things on this uh, plum tree. What is it? That is a ladybug pupa. This is soft scale. So the ladybug pupa is there because of the soft scale. It is actually, I'm sure there was other ladybugs and probably some ladybug larvae going around and actually feeding on the soft scale. But the best way to manage the soft scale is just to scrape it off with your thumb. Kind of gross. We can also use horticultural oils. Yes. All right. I think now we're going to talk about what everyone's been waiting for, the specific pest management. So we'll talk about ants, slugs and snails, rats and mice, gophers, raccoons, and cats. Several questions about cats already. And we'll talk about preventative, uh, preventatively using dormant sprays. So first ants, uh, outdoors ants, again, we're talking about thresholds. We might have a higher threshold for ants outdoors as we should because that's where they are supposed to be living. And ants are decomposers, they aerate our soil and they can eat some insect pests. Uh, while though uh, in the upper left photo with the ladybug, um, they are actually fighting off that ladybug because ants do like to protect pests like aphids and scale um, that uh, those, those insects leave behind a sweet residue called honeydew and ants love that stuff. So they'll actually fight off the enemies of the aphids um, to protect those, uh, those pests. So Ants, yes, are good in some ways, but they are also harmful in some ways uh, when we're doing pest management. But they can also be indicators. When we see ants crawling up a tree, a tree uh, trunk, we can probably, you know, my, my guess is that there is something else in that tree that those ants are going for. So outdoors, if we do choose to manage um, ants outdoors, uh, we're going to focus on, you know, again, why are they there? Are they protecting those aphids? Are they farming that honeydew? So maybe we're going to manage, focusing on managing the aphid scale and other pests instead to keep them from fighting off the ladybugs and other beneficials. We're going to con consider using a sticky insect glue like Tanglefoot or the, uh, the bio glue. Uh, we always want to put a piece of paper around our tree trunk before applying the sticky glue. We're never putting that glue directly on our tree trunk. And then there are outdoor ant controls uh, with spinosad or boric acid or borax. And, and some are come in the little stakes like that taro uh, liquid ant bait comes in a stake that you can put out near your plants as well. 
indoor, um, our uh, tolerances are definitely a little bit lower and that's understandable. So there's some things we can do before we reach for a pesticide. Uh, we're gonna kill the scouts, those, those initial in, uh, ants that we're seeing kind of crawling around looking for food. Uh, we're gonna uh, wipe those up with a soapy sponge and then wipe up the area that you're seeing them because they leave a scent trail. So we wanna disturb that trail. We're gonna make sure our homes are nice and clean and remove any food, maybe put fruit in the fridge. We're gonna seal up our compost, maybe put our compost in the fridge too. Um, and then, you know, make sure our, our pet food bowls are, are clean and empty most of the time. Then we're gonna find out where they're coming in, seal up those cracks and crevices, add weather stripping to doors and windows. Again, physical barriers are really uh, gonna be the most effective to indoor, for indoor pests. Um, I even recommend, you know, temporarily, you don't want to do the whole caulking of everything. Just this piece of scotch tape can be really effective on a little hole. Um, so it can be really simple and it's going to be a very effective. And then other popular um, uh, products that to buy are the ant bait stations, the taro with boric acid and a sugar bait. Um, very popular and very effective. You do need to wait uh, allow them to do their job it's going to get worse before it gets better because they're going to find that sugar bait and kind of go crazy on it and that's okay that means it's working so have a little um uh, patience with those baits but they are going to be effective um, i will say sprays can be effective as well but again they're contact kills so you're only killing the ants in front of you whereas baits they're going to be they're meant to be brought back to the colony and kill the whole colony that way um, some safety concerns to consider with the baits, though, is we don't want kids or pets chewing on them, so make sure they're secured or hidden away where they can't be accessed. Other ways to um, treat ants, roaches, silverfish, other crawling insects that might come in the home uh, are two kinds of powders. The boric acid powder is uh, kind of like sand or salt. Uh, that's how uh, fine it is and it will be placed where you're seeing the ants or the crawling insects, it will be ingested and it disrupts the gut bacteria, um, which will end up starving the, <laughs> the, uh, the creature. And then diatomaceous earth is another option, a very fine chalky powder. And also you're gonna put it along like the edges of the, the, the floor where you're seeing the crawling insects. It's gonna, they're gonna crawl over it it's gonna um, dehydrate their exoskeleton and uh, it dehydrates them. It's like when we have chalk on our fingers and we, our fingers get really dry, it's similar to that. Um, uh, those are again, very, very safe products, but we do wanna make sure they're not going to be uh, licked up or sniffed in by any other kid or pet um, because uh, diatomaceous earth, super fine. It can be a long irritant. And of course we don't want um, ingesting although it's I will say I've heard it's it's not like you know horribly toxic but we do of course want to keep it away from creatures all right and then in the garden snails slugs earwigs um, can cause a lot of damage especially now that it's uh, cooler moister a lot damper outside uh, snails and slugs and earwigs love those um, Actually, can you go back one, back to that original? Thank you. I was gonna point out that um, this is some damage from all of those creatures, but we do wanna remember identification is key because caterpillars, birds, mice can also uh, create similar damage. So again, we're gonna look for signs of these pests, slime trails from snails and slugs, uh, earwigs. You can usually find them hiding under um, other like rocks and um, things like that. So gonna, you're gonna look for them to know that you're actually targeting snail slugs and earwigs. For snails and slugs, we are going to reduce their hiding places, which could be a pile of pots that you have or some, some debris. You uh, can pull them off. That's a great mechanical control. Just wear gloves because they can sometimes carry diseases. Uh, so uh, you can pull them off, drop them in some soapy water. You can use a snail board trap. Uh, that's the board on the top left. Those, uh, that's just like, you know, a place for them to hide in the heat of the day. 
they like dark cool places so they'll go under there in the heat of the day and then you can lift it up in that in midday and you scrape them off into some soapy water uh, the copper barrier tape uh, snails and slugs don't like uh, crawling over copper uh, it gives them like a kind of like an electric shock or something so they don't they don't like to um, crawl over it uh, so you can line your pots or your raised beds with copper barrier tape and hopefully prevent them make sure though you don't have snails and slugs already in the the pot or the raised bed or else you're just basically keeping them in there uh, chunky wood mulch can also prevent some snails and slugs they don't like crawling over it and then if we want to go for a pesticide um, anything with iron phosphate bait which is usually sluggo and there's a few other um, products too that have that iron phosphate uh, that's going to be very safe for kids and uh, the environment for earwigs um, somewhat similar we're actually i should have mentioned this for snails and slugs we're going to reduce our evening moisture because earwigs slugs and snails like cool damp uh, environments so if we water in the morning the, the uh, plants will dry, be drier by the evening um, so always watering in the morning. We always recommend watering in the morning for, for fungal diseases, everything, water in the morning. But this should help reduce earwigs. Uh, you can use an earwig trap. That picture on the bottom left is just a, you know, a deli takeout container. Poke some holes in it, sink it down into the soil so at the top is at soil level, and fill it with something like uh, fish oil, like something from a tuna can, some fishy stuff, fish sauce is good, maybe fish emulsion. Um, you can try some other things like soy sauce, try, you know, try something uh, that will attract them. And you can also put a little drop of uh, dish soap in there um, or Castile soap. <laughs> um, and then um, that should, they should crawl in there looking for that fishy smell and then get trapped in there. Other tools or other pesticides are uh, some diatomaceous earth can be used around plants um, to prevent them from crawling around it. Uh, it needs to be kept dry to be effective. And then um, iron phosphate baits with spinosad, so Sluggo Plus or the bug, Captain Jack's Bug and Slug Killer. Uh, the spinosad is going to help prevent earwigs. All right, rats, big problem. <laughs> so, rats in the garden, as I mentioned, it's really hard to. Uh, keep uh, rodents away from yummy veggies, except for physical exclusion. So, uh, and there's a few, so yeah, outdoors managing rats is, you know, reducing food sources and reducing places where they can hide. So removing places of harborage, uh, thick ivy, dense brush, any place where they can nest and hide. And then we're going to try to remove any food sources. And that just means containing our compost securely, our chicken coops, uh, keeping our garbage cans really secure. Uh, maybe uh, don't free feed your pet outside all night, take that in, uh, removing, you know, removing pet food from outside. We're not feeding wild uh, feral cats or anything. Uh, consider maybe removing bird feeders. Uh, bird seed is a is a great food for, for rats as well. <laughs> so you might be attracting rats if you're also attracting birds with bird seed. Um, and then excluding them from your, from your veggies and, uh, with food, with uh, barriers like exclusion frames. So that's also a way to remove their food sources. Inside the home, it's also gonna be exclusion. Uh, but there's also things we can do. We're going to, you know, place all of our food in metal or really secure glass containers to prevent it from being very attractive. Uh, remember in the garage, the, the bird seed, the pet food that you're, you're uh, storing, um, you uh, want to seal that up in a metal or a glass container. And then um, places that they like to nest, uh, mice really love uh, cardboard and other, um, you know, if you have linens stored in your attic, it's a great little nesting area for uh, mice. So you got you got to put them into plastic bins. Um, and then more. So those are called cultural controls, removing our food sources and removing places to nest. And then we're going to focus on our mechanical controls, our barriers. 
uh, replacing our weather stripping, um, checking the foundation and attic vents and adding quarter inch hardware cloth, checking all other vents um, and covering them with uh, hardware cloth, sheet metal flashing uh, or hardware cloth with expanding foam to seal gaps, and then caulking and patching holes in walls um, and just repairing, just really sealing up your home is going to be the best way that you never have to worry about trapping or anything else unpleasant. So rats can chew through pretty much everything, <laughs> including concrete and dry drywall, but they cannot chew through hardware cloth, which is made of galvanized wire uh, fencing. It's kind of that mesh um, roll right in the middle or sheet metal flashing. And when we're using hardware cloth, we're always gonna use quarter inch because that is the size that young, uh, that is the size that uh, they can't fit through. Mice and young rats can fit through a hole the size of a pencil. So quarter inch is gonna be a little bit smaller than that. So they can't fit through it. So again, when you're looking to seal up your home, you're looking for pencil sized holes, not like little rat or mouse holes like we see in the cartoons, tiny, tiny cracks. And here's just some examples of how we can use hardware cloth over vents, um, just, you know, securing it around the vent. And then uh, these sheet metal like corners are gonna be great for sealing up that gap left by um, rats and mice chewing the corner of the garage door. All right, just a few more. I'm going to now talk a little bit about the IPM approach for gophers and moles. Proper identification is the key. Uh, remember that gophers, uh, they are going to go for the roots of plants. They absolutely love eating our plant roots. Uh, they're actually really smart. And the more mature the gopher is, you'll notice that, well, I've noticed you might learn that they will not devour the entire root. They're actually going to be trimming those root hairs so that they can have a constant supply of food, very crazy. Um, they also will tunnel a little deeper. They're gonna be tunneling about six to 12 inches below the surface of the soil. They have extensive burrowing systems and their mounds are going to be crescent shape. Uh, moles, moles I see as beneficial because they're eating a lot of bugs. They're eating earthworms, white grubs, beetles, and other soil dwelling larvae. So they're actually doing me a service. However, they can uh, cause some aesthetic damage, cosmetic damage to like a turf area because their tunnels are shallow. They're only tunneling about four to eight inches below the surface. So a lot of times you can actually see their tunneling pattern because it's been pushed up, that soil has been pushed up. They also have uh, very elaborate burrowing systems. So here is a picture of a gopher mound animal mound. So gophers, as I said, it's crescent shaped or fanned out because the way they uh, dig and come to the surface is at an angle. So they are pushing the soil out in this fan shape as they come out. And then you can almost see the little plug that is in the center. So it's almost like a um, seashell or an ear. You'll see like a little plug. That's actually the hole that they just uh, sealed off. And then a mole mound is just like like it says, it's a mound. Um, it from profile, it looks like a little mini volcano. It just is perfectly circular. And um, typically you don't see the plug. So for gophers, we want to always use preventative means by uh, using physical barriers. Um, it's the best, most effective way to manage gophers. We're going to plant everything in a gopher basket or line our raised beds with uh, that half inch hardware cloth or gopher wire, as Charlotte has been sharing with us earlier. And then um, just understand if we really need to use a repellent, there are amazing repellents on the market. Uh, please, we recommend um, the ones that have castor oil as an active ingredient. We found that those are the most effective. Use them um, according to the label because it's a little complicated. It's not just something to shake out and think it's going to work. We really have to follow the instructions because there is a system to it. And um, But understand that uh, this, the repellents are going to be temporary deterrents, but when we can use them and apply them, they are going to definitely help us out during a short period of time. 
There are a number of different uh, types of gopher traps on the market, and I pretty much have every single one of these that's on this page. I use all of these gopher traps regularly. Um, I have found that some traps work better for other situations. You kind of kind of learn what's going to be the best trap for the situation you're in, but essentially they're either going to be pinch traps or plants, uh, traps that kind of uh, girdle or um, pinch um, like the, a band that kind of um, suffocates it a little bit. It is um, not always nice to manage um, animals that we have to kill, but the gopher traps are very effective for keeping the populations down. Moles, we're going to remove their food source. So if they are tunneling in your lawn, going for the grubs, let's remove their food source. And we're gonna remove the food source with beneficial nematodes because beneficial nematodes feed on soil dwelling uh, larvae and other insects. And then we're going to use the castor oil repellents repellents as a temporary deterrent. Uh, there are mole traps on the market. However, what I found is that uh, it's a lot more challenging to try to uh, trap a mole, uh, way easier to trap a gopher. So mole traps are not as popular with um, a lot of people that are out there trying to manage the moles. And does this look familiar to anyone? Does anyone face with this right now? Because a lot of the clients I talk to are seeing this. Well, it's because of our raccoons, okay? The raccoons are actually going for the grubs and uh, they're looking for the grubs and they have a very, they're very good at rolling turf back, okay? So how do we manage uh, raccoons? And I'm just gonna put moles in that same category because they also do a lot of damage to the turf areas, but we wanna keep those turf areas healthy. We want to make sure we're feeding that turf lawn with uh, organic fertilizers, allowing those root systems to grow much deeper than um, the average person would expect. That means we're gonna be watering deeper. We're gonna be mowing. Uh, the height will change per season. And we're gonna use exclusion when possible. So if we know a, it's raccoon season where they start coming looking for grubs, let's put that poultry wire down as a barrier, anchor it down, and then the raccoons can't roll up the carpet. Um, we can also use bird netting. Bird netting is a little bit more challenging to work with, but either way, it's gonna work really well. Um, if we're trying to use some type of a barrier for moles, uh, it is not unheard of for people to actually create um, a liner of uh, hardware cloth or gopher wire uh, underneath and all around the sides of the lawn area to prevent moles in, um, entering, entering that area. We are going to remove that food source with beneficial nematodes to make sure that we are not feeding that wildlife and we are going to train them that there is no reward. There are no grubs here, so go away. Beneficial nematodes, um, we can buy them from uh, our local garden centers right now, it's kind of the end of the season. So they'll start uh, stocking them again in the spring. Rick on Vitova, someone asked already where we buy beneficial insects. That is one of the best insectaries here in the state of California. Um, they also are have amazing information on their website. So check that out. And then what are beneficial nematodes? As I mentioned, they're microscopic worm-like organisms and they feed on soil dwelling uh, insects such as fungus gnat larvae. So if the fungus gnat is that small, then you can imagine how tiny those nematodes are. We don't see them, but they're very, very effective. Always following the directions on the package when they arrive. And for cats and squirrels, uh, we're going to work with the deterrents. We're going to cover that soil and those planting beds with a cat scat mat. You can buy these online. I think they also sell them at some local um, stores like Walmart or something. Uh, poultry wire is also going to work, but those cat scat mats actually are little uh, prongs. It's not, uh, I think they're just plastic, so it's not like dangerous or anything, but the cats really don't like it. However, they're both of these products, either cat scat mats or poultry wire is excellent to prevent squirrels and cats from digging. We can also use bird netting, but again, bird netting might not be as effective, but if we need to cover an area, like for instance, if a squirrel's getting into a fruit tree, we really wanna make sure we are securing that, uh, that fruit tree and preventing them from getting in there. And then repellents. There are a lot of repellents on the market like cat scram or critter ritter. Again, these are gonna be temporary deterrents. These are gonna be very effective products uh, follow the directions. Um, but really what we want to do is we want to avoid feeding feral and wild animals because this contributes to the problem. 
and then dormant sprays. So dormant sprays, this, you know, it's dormant seasons. Dormant season has begun. We start to see leaves dropping from the trees. Uh, our fruit trees and roses are going to be the most common uh, plants that we would use a dormant season spray. What that means, excuse me. What that means is that we're applying a pesticide, either the horticultural oil, which will combat and manage um, suffocating any insects that are overwintering or using a uh, copper fungicide that will uh, kill off any fungal spores that are overwintering. We're using these products at a stronger mixing rate. And when there are no leaves on those fruit trees, uh, these are deciduous fruit trees such as apples, peaches, plums, not citrus. We can spray at a stronger mixing rate because there are no leaves on the plant uh, that would cause any type of phytotoxicity. Roses also, we're going to defoliate those leaves or you know, eventually those leaves are going to fall and we are going to be able to apply these products. They're excellent for preventing spring pests. So what we're doing is we're just buying a little time. We're actually knocking back that first generation of aphids or any fungal spores that might be overwintering. And it's going to be extremely helpful for um, preventing some of those pests from really getting extremely bad in the spring. We're always going to apply according to the label's uh, directions and then understand as soon as there is the buds emerge and then they crack and we can see that petal color, dormant season is over. You can get a lot of information on this at the UC statewide IPM website. The other awesome online resource we'd like to share is Our Water, Our World, where you'll see our library of fact sheets to uh, manage a lot of common pest problems around the home and garden, as well as some gardening and home um, uh, uh, practical, you know, how to hire a professional seat, uh, practical information like that. And then the statewide um, UCIPM program, which is not only in a huge searchable database of amazing information on uh, plants and pests and all, you know, how to manage it and identifying different weeds and identifying different wildlife, but you can also sign up for the Home and Garden Pest Newsletter. So this is really cool. It comes to your uh, email. It's a quarterly publication. I encourage you to sign up for that. And then when we need some support around proper uh, pest identification, if you have an insect in your garden and you're not sure what it is, you can always uh, send a picture to bugguide.net and they will help you out with that. And then um, if we've got pesticides and we're really curious about what those active ingredients are, what their mode of actions are, what are the unintended consequences, the National Pesticide Information Center is amazing. I just... It's, I, I love reading all the information there. It's really helpful. And with that, oh my gosh, thank you all for still being with us. Uh, we would love to take any more questions. Um, yeah, this was a big program. We couldn't not add something. There was Sorry. so much to say. We wanted to get all the info for you all. <laughs>